They understood better than we did the new audacious imperialism that was born in 1971 when Bretton Woods collapsed and the United States dollar was no longer convertible to gold, prompting Richard Nixon to send a message to Europeans, European governments, and the world's capitalists saying, the dollar, as of today, is your problem. And how right Nixon was. As the American, the US, I shouldn't say American, as the US deficit skyrocketed, the world was flooded with American dollars. And the banks, the central banks outside the United States were forced to use these American dollars, since they could not be converted to gold anymore, as the reserves with which they backed their own currency. The dollar suddenly became something like an IOU issued by the hegemon. Before long, the global financial system was backed by IOUs issued by the hegemon, who decided what foreigners holding those IOUs could do or couldn't do with the IOUs issued by the hegemon. America was now a fully-fledged deficit country with a big trade deficit, but it was nothing like any other deficit country in the world. You see, Argentina, France, India, Greece hmm, needed to borrow dollars. America didn't need to borrow dollars to back up its currency. It didn't need to raise interest rates in order to prevent an exodus of dollars. The exodus of dollars was the foundation of American hegemony. Capitalists in central, uh, in surplus countries, countries like Japan, Germany, and later, of course, China, saw the American trade deficit as a great savior. It was a huge vacuum cleaner the American trade deficit that was sucking into America the net exports of Germany, Japan, China. And what did the Japanese, German, and later Chinese capitalists do with all these dollars that they earned? They sent them back to the United States, they couldn't do anything else with them, to buy property in the United States, American government bonds, and the few companies that the American government allowed them to buy, not Boeing, not Microsoft, none of the crucial ones. Meanwhile, the deficit countries in the global South, in Asia, in Latin America, they constantly agonized over a shortage of dollars, which they had to borrow from Wall Street to import medicines, energy, and the raw materials necessary to produce their own exports for earning the dollars with which to repay Wall Street. Inevitably, every now and then, as you all know, the Global South deficit nations run out of dollars and could not repay Wall Street. That is when the West sent in the bailiffs, the International Monetary Fund, that lent the dollars on condition that the debtor government handed over the country's land, water, ports, airports, electricity, telephone networks, even its schools and hospitals to the local and to the international oligarchs who grabbed this treasure, took rents, and what did they do with the rents? Sent them to American rentier capitalism to invest them. Washington, comrades, had found the magic formula that no other empire had discovered before of how to make wealthy foreigners and wealthy governments and poor governments and the poor of the world finance the American government and the net imports of the American economy. A Chinese official once described to me globalization as something that was founded on a dark deal. That's how the Chinese official put it to me, a dark deal. Why did he call it dark? Because it was founded on a dark, unspoken, implicit pact between Americans ruling, America's ruling class and foreign capitalists and rentiers. Let me put it slightly differently. Suppose you could end American hegemony today. There is a button here, you can press it and end US hegemony. Who would stop you from pressing it? Okay, 
the U.S. authorities, the military, the CIA, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, they will try to stop you from pressing this button. But they are not alone. A crowd of non-Americans would stop you from pressing it, including German industrialists, Saudi sheikhs, Greek oligarchs, European bankers, and yes, Chinese capitalists. In other words, the supremacy of the dollar has been just as functional to the interests of U.S. and dear capitalism as it was to German, Argentinian, Nigerian, Korean, and Chinese capitalists. Without the dollars and American's global dominance, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, or German capitalists would not have been able continually to extract colossal surplus value from their workers and then stash it away in America's rentier economy. Meanwhile, Argentinian, Greek, Russian, Ukrainian, and Indian oligarchs would not be able to loot our countries, take their public assets, liquidate them, and turn them into property rights in the United States. The lesson for us is simple. We must not repeat the mistake of thinking that the new international economic order will be built because the governments or the elites of the South are going to band together against the North, against Washington or the European Union. Our non-aligned movement will fail if we give it a narrow road, a narrow road of bringing together the G77, the BRICS, in opposition to the West. We need to beware, not only the functionaries in London, in Paris, in Brussels, in Washington, who work tirelessly to make sure that we fail, that nothing changes, but also government officials who are very close to the interests of capitalists in the global south, including in China, and who use the U.S. trade deficit to exploit their people, their country, and then stash their dollarized surplus in the United States, in the Cayman Islands, in Delaware, in the dollar circuits. Do we want to be true internationalists? If we do, then let's not forget who are the one people, one people who have probably most to gain from the end of US dominance. The American working class in the United States who have been condemned for decades to immiseration, to deaths, of despair, to being called deplorables. Yes, let us never forget that imperialism's victims have always resided both in the metropolis and in the periphery. That the current international economic order, which we want to smash, inflicts different types of misery on workers everywhere. Globalization forced American workers into an immiseration brought on by underinvestment and deindustrialization. It was as if part of the global south had moved into the Midwest, into the north of England, into parts of Germany, into parts of Greece, of Italy, of Spain. At the same time, the same globalization process forced Chinese workers in the coastal towns of China to suffer the frenzied exploitation associated with overinvestment. It was as if parts of the north of the global north had moved to these Chinese cities. But the people working there were working with wages and conditions of the miserized global south. Different miseries, same recycling process, same recycling mechanism that takes values extracted at the local level and recycles them globally. Today, this same globalization, which turned American deficits, feeding Chinese capital into American rents, this globalization today is being replaced, as we speak, by a new Cold War between the United States and China. 